Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Welcome to The Open Door, a show based on the words in Revelation, I have left an open door before you, which no one can close. This is WCAT Radio's longest-running show, which opened the door to the radio station in October 2016. It's currently offered by Jim Hanink, Mario Ramos Reyes and Friends, and remains open to the love of God in its call to build a culture of life and a just social order through the panel's discussion of the Catholic social teaching principles of solidarity, subsidiarity, and economic democracy. The Open Door also explores nonviolence, distributism, and communitarianism. So join us at The Open Door, where you too can be part of the conversation. Welcome to The Open Door. Jim Hannock here with co-host Mario Ramos-Reyes, and once again our good friend Christopher Zender, a fellow member of the American Solidarity Party, is here with us. Today, we're going to continue to discuss the new ASP, American Solidarity Party, platform's plank on civil rights and religious liberty. I think we'll finish... And I think, if time allows, we'll turn to the next plank, uh, which is on criminal justice. We begin, as always, in prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you will renew the face of the earth. Lord, By the light of the Holy Spirit, you have taught the hearts of your faithful. In the same spirit, help us to relish what is right and always rejoice in your consolation. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The particular bullet point, and we go from platform to plank to the bullet points therein, that we'll begin with is as follows. It's uh, on the long side. Throughout our nation's history, racial discrimination has stripped ethnic minorities of their wealth and limited their eligibility to work, ability to own property, educational access, and voting rights at the individual and community levels. We recognize the particular forms of exclusion suffered by African Americans, Latinos, Asian Americans, and Native Americans. These historic injustices should be addressed through reparative and restorative means, such as economic grants and policies which incentivize investment, job training, and hiring in minority communities, and by continuing dialogue between communities and local governments regarding minority concerns. Mario, what's your initial reaction to this bullet point? Well, my <clears throat> my initial reaction is that... Um, um it's um i think it's um it's good um there is an acknowledgement about uh, the nation's history um about minorities uh, not only from the beginning but recent history and, and also the desire from the party stating this platform about some kind of reparation or some means to uh, reparate those uh, those um, years of discrimination, if you will. And, and then the examples given that is economic grant and policies. 
uh, which is, I think, in that sense, um, incentivize that investment, job training. And I think it's very, um, very moderate the way that the party uh, confront these, um, uh, these issues. I think there's no uh, sense of extremism here. And so, uh, at first sight, I think I, I'm, I feel, I don't know, very in agreement with that. Now, when we begin to discuss how to go about and get into the details, what are the policies which are going to lead us in order to um, satisfy the political actor in those uh, in those uh, in those realities, that's another matter. But well, yes, this is a platform. It's not a recipe of policies. That's my first reaction. All right. So, do you think it's a, a good statement? And of course, the particulars. Uh, well, they depend on all sorts of things, and they have to be worked out one by one. And uh, area by area, and uh, economic sector by economic sector. Christopher, your thoughts? Well, I, I think I'm, I'm basically agree with Mario. I, um, there have been historic injustices, and those injustices have their effects today. So I guess I would like to, the the the, pl the, pl the plank is a little vague as is proper, I think, as to what measures, like Mario says, it should be taken. I would tend to want to favor measures which actually simply re, um, bring people into the full relationship of justice in society. And like, for instance, um, talking about uh, means such as economic grants and policies which incentivize investment, job training, hiring in minority communities, that's important. But it's important um, because that they, they suffer a basic lack of access to those those elements of the common good, the material elements of the common good, which are necessary for a full flourishing of the human life. The thing is, is that there are other communities which are not minority communities that also suffer this way. I think of some of the rural towns here in Ohio, uh, with the with the very depressed conditions. Um, I think of places like Appalachia. And mm -hmm. so I would, I, my my emphasis would always be more on economic justice for everybody in every sector of society, and where that economic justice requires an ad addressing the issues of race, then we address the issues of race. I know, but I'm not sure that's where we start with the issues of race. Mm -hmm. I think we start with basic injustices that people are suffering, um, whether they're w white or black or brown, whatever, and then we go on to um, discuss what, say, added measures need to be taken to help people who have um, suffered from historic injustices. That would be basically my, my emphasis. I, part of this, too, is I always worry that these issues are often used to divide and conquer the working class, people who are disadvantaged. And so the one way you can keep them from being effective, having um, united power, against the, the force that would, would keep them down is by dividing them based upon things like race. That's uh, uh, perceptive, very perceptive. The, the idea would then be let's focus first on uh, class differences and then as we do that, we'll have a, a special scrutiny of race-based differences, uh, country of origin-based differences, and the like, rather than begin by uh, counting by counting by race. We begin by counting everybody, and then in, in circumstances, we look especially to people who have been excluded because of, well, here mentioned uh, African Americans, Latinos, Asian Americans, and Native Americans. And Appalachia is, is certainly an example. 
let me give two particulars, and then perhaps uh, you both might respond uh, in light of these two particulars. Particular number one, Inglewood High School. Um, let's say 50% uh, African American and 50% Latino. Uh, and the, the shift is increasingly towards Latinos. Uh, a group of high school students there within the last five years or so uh, pressed forward a legal case that called attention to the fact that there were no uh, no classes for high school students that would give them advanced placement at the college level. Uh, and when a change began, it was minimal. All of a sudden, there was one such advanced placement course. And all the time here, uh, the high school from which one of my sons graduated, the, the high school has been, as it were, in receivership to the state of California because the local school board simply couldn't manage it. Hmm. Now, as it happens, the student body is overwhelmingly African American and Latino, although I imagine that the same is the case in places in Ohio, that there are high schools that have, for all practical purposes, uh, no special effort to give students uh, a leg up on their college work. Would that be so? I'm yeah. I'm not. I'm not diverse enough with those conditions of public schools to say. Um, but it, I would it wouldn't imagine. surprise me if that weren't the case. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's. I know there. You know, some school districts have. That are really considered very prime here, and others are not. <laughs> and the like Columbus City Schools, I don't think, are considered prime. But some of the outline, like Worthington, is a, a suburb. It is considered to have a very good school district. So, all right. How does it look in Kansas? Well, it's. Um, I think it's. Um, if you look, I, I didn't uh, go to to high school here, but uh, my children did. Um, what I perceive is that. Um, the access to uh, schools are related to the neighborhood where you live. And so um, the neighborhood where you live is based upon the opportunity you had. And so coming from outside, and not knowing the language, not knowing how people relate one another, because always, always you need to learn when you are an outsider, whether you are coming from South America or someplace else, but when you are coming from someplace else, it's more difficult. So in order to have access, you have to have opportunity. In order to have opportunity, you need to have the skills. Uh, that take a toll to people and, and and I experienced that in other in order where you need to make a double effort in order to take the opportunities that have been offered to you. Now what sometimes is lacking is that uh, you don't have the support in order to get prepared to take the opportunities. And I think that is because the system what uh, the economic system lack the sense of the common good. The, I think the system, as I perceive that, is based mainly on competition. 
competition, which means that, well, the, the most fitting individual is the one who wins and have access. But then when you come from a different place, a different way of understanding, that is more difficult and take more time. And so um, now, and, but there, there are opportunities there, but it's different when you have to run uh, a, a long distance than people are already there. So that may feel, you may feel you are discriminated. I don't see that as discrimination, rather than you're starting from a different starting point. So the question is to what extent our society can somehow um, receive those who come from a different place and help them in order to compete the other who are already there. That's very difficult uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, you are um, uh, foreigners and, and so on. You are just uh, God here. And you need to get more experience and all that. And all that. So that is a, a very unique phenomenon that you need to experience. It's very hard to explain from outside. Let me uh, give you a comment which uh, caught my attention yesterday. Uh, I was uh, following to some extent, not very careful, uh, very closely, but I just uh, was uh, following the Conference of Bishop election of the new president. And then I, I learned that the, the, the president elected, uh, the, uh, Bishop Gomez from LA. Well, I, I knew him by name. I don't know exactly uh, in person, but I, I know where he's coming from and so on, and even know his spirituality, you know. Um, and so and then the title, uh, and then you have the, all the headlines, and he's the first Hispanic and the first. Uh, immigrant to become president, get elected president of the Conference of Bishops. And then some Catholics outlet make the comment, which for me were precisely that point. Say, well, that's the first uh, president, and he is not even an American. That's the, 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 the expression. Well, he's naturalized American. But he says he's not even an American. Now, I, I, I'm not saying that it was intentional, but what I'm saying is that precisely that, I think, sometimes is the case. It takes more effort because there is, a, it, there is a long distance that you need to go in order to be considered. And that, I think, is an achievement, whether you like him or not, whether he is what you were expecting him to be or not. But I think we, in our um, issue regarding um, uh, migration and perhaps racial justice, we need to take into account this. And everything boils down, I think, ultimately, in what is the common good? I think the common good, I think, is, is key. Is the common good just giving people who come here opportunities and freedom so that they can compete, or there should be something else, something else there. I think that's a, a reflection that uh, comes to, to me and it's regarding this issue. It's interesting because um, I to sort of make case. a point. Yes, go ahead, Christopher. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, because uh, uh, something about the Ohio schools just came, I heard from the NPR local NPR station the other day about this whole thing, and one of the one of the things they were talking about was certain mandates that are made on teachers and uh, protesting students. And the, the difficulty this in the Columbus City Schools is that in some cases you have many cases in the poorer places, uh, whether whether racially based or not, is, is that you have parents who maybe both parents work one or two or three jobs. And so the assumption is is that parents are going to be helping, say, their children with homework. But when they're working like that, they can't do it. So the, the economic system tends to undermine the ability of parents to raise their children properly. And that that is one yeah. way that that's the that there's inequality, if you will, or lack of opportunity 
for the students in the, in the schools because they live in an economic system which deprives a lot of people of, of a just living, of a, a proper access to what they need to feed and clothe their families, but also what they need in order to have the leisure time to st spend with their families. You can't equalize everything, even if you had just wages, um, because there's gonna, there are going to be parents who are better parents and parents that are worse parents, but um, whatever society can do to make it easier for people to raise their children is going to go a long way in um, improving, I think, the Holy, the, the educational system as well. So everything that strengthens families will strengthen the education system. Exactly, right, exactly. Yes. Yes. Here's a, a opportunity, I think, for Catholic education uh, at the high school level uh, in Los Angeles, the greater Los Angeles area. There's a certain attention given every year to what we could describe as a kind of high school academic Olympics. And every year, two or three schools are, are the main competitors. And as Mario pointed out, there are schools that come from uh, affluent areas. Now, suppose we had Catholic education that was uh, less local in the sense that it didn't draw students only from one area, but it drew students from uh, throughout the larger Los Angeles area. Now, it, it could be that some of these Catholic schools, high schools, would be in different parts of the greater Los Angeles area. We'd expect that, but, but nonetheless, they wouldn't be so localized as to be restricted to affluent neighborhoods. I could imagine those uh, Catholic schools providing very distinctive opportunities to high school students who would not otherwise have them. And that would be a real contribution to the common good. And when we think of the common good, it's more than just providing everyone a roughly equal playing ground so that they can all compete, so that the competitors can have some sort of special standing, but rather it's providing people a roughly equal playing ground so that they can in turn develop their full potential so that with that full potential they can truly give back to the larger community and everyone can benefit from their successes. Right. Here's a, but, but, yes, so go ahead, please. Well, I, I, I just uh, a comment uh, uh, that I have experienced. I teach in a Catholic college. Um, um, five years ago, I began teaching quarter time, and because I, there is a program there for uh, future uh, priests, and so I teach philosophy there. Um, but the whole college is college. Uh, it's an urban college. Um, mainly is a college for people, uh, young kids who are disadvantaged, mainly minorities, African Americans and Latinos. And it's a, a very, very good uh, institution. But there is a, there is a. Uh, the college uh, has been struggling for variety of reasons. One of them is because precisely uh, when you have a degree of such an institution, it seems if you are coming from, a, uh, let's say, wealthy family, you may not have as a valuable uh, uh, degree than if you get from another institution. So generally, uh, kids who come from family who are able to pay go to a different Catholic college who has more prestige. Um, in in the content of the, the of what they can provide, there's no much difference. But yet there is a perception that, that some colleges, because certain um, uh, physical characteristic of the buildings or the 
the image they have built over the over time or the marketing they they have seems to be more appropriate certain families and so this uh, view of um, the market uh, make uh, or uh, make the parents to send their children to this uh, type of college while we are there providing very similar to disadvantaged kids if we don't receive the number of students that we, I think, reserve. And I think it, everything boils down again to what is the image that we have or we are um, instilling in, in our Catholic family about what is the common good or what is education. And I understand that there is a pressure from society which is asking the kid to really get the best uh, degree from the best university so they can get a better job and so on. So it seems to me that there is a culture around around these uh, colleges, if you will, that put pressure. And there are certain uh, ideas which are not are incompatible with the idea of the common good. And so that I think is very important to um, to try to promote this idea, the, the correct understanding of the common good, because that's hurting families who are really need um, need help in the good sense. Surely so. Let's before we move on, let's let's have one more example. I can provide one more local example of reparative and restorative strategies for redressing past wrongs. Going right by our parish church, uh, which has over 12,000 registered families uh, there in the parish, uh, there's a, a new part of Caltrans. Caltrans, California Transportation, is forever trying, and it's a hard thing to do, to bring more trains into the greater Los Angeles area. So here we have, and we've had it for the last maybe two years, uh, a new train outlet that's going to run right past our parish church, and I mean right past it. You want to cross the street? Uh, Well, it'll take a while because you'll have to cross this uh, train track that's being restructured. And doing this job amounts to hiring lots and lots and lots of people for the, the, the construction effort. And now what I've noticed over the past, say, six months is a whole, what, two-mile uh, range of large uh, signs picturing specific people not with their last name, but with their first name, Yolanda C., uh, Jefferson W., and a picture of the person. Mm -hmm. Uh, They don't look like just uh, stand-ins, actual pictures. Uh, People from that area who have been hired as construction workers to, to build what's going up right there before our eyes. Now, what was involved in that? Uh, it, it wasn't uh, first come, first serve. Uh, jobs are now going to be available uh, for workers for Caltrans, California Transportation. But there was, I, I'm, I'm confident of this, uh, a, a real effort to try to hire people from that neighborhood. And then when the hires were made, to make it very clear that, yes, that's what we said we were going to do, and that's what we did. And here are the pictures of these people, some of whom you might very well recognize. Now, I'm sure that along the way there was some injustice of some sort, but I think overall my impression was this took some real thinking, it was restorative and reparative for the uh, racial groups in the area of, uh, well, our parish, going right by our church, 
And and I think it was a, a very eloquent way of saying something can be done, and here's one thing we're doing, and you see it's working, and it's right in front of you. And in another six months, you'll be passengers, as will be other people, because the, the Caltrans system begins way, way far away, and it works its way gradually. In our case, it's working its way gradually towards the airport. I, I see that as a, a positive development. Well, yeah, and it, it, what's interesting about that is um, it, it's not clear that it's it, it's it's actually racially based, except by accident. It seems like it's more neighborhood based. Yes, that's true. That's true. Yeah, that's true. And insofar as it's neighborhood. And the jobs are going to people who, for the most part, have families and their groups that have been in the past disadvantaged. Uh, the, the deciding factors come together, I think, in a pretty, a pretty uh, promising package. Well, next bullet point. Not quite so long, but it's at least as uh, important and as involved. Disability rights. Disability rights remain a significant concern throughout the United States. Government agencies working with the disabled must ensure that financial benefits are applied fairly and consistently. They must also make more efforts to incorporate the disabled into work or volunteer programs, depending on individual circumstances. Well, that's short enough that I could read it again. Disability rights remain a significant concern throughout the United States. Government agencies working with the disabled must ensure that financial benefits are applied fairly and consistently. They must also make more efforts to incorporate the disabled into work or volunteer programs depending on individual circumstances. You want to get us started with that one, Mario? Well, again, I think in reading these, and I read already a um, couple of times before, I think it's, um, it's clear enough is uh, to my taste a little bit succinct, but very short. I think should be expanded a little bit more, um, but it's um, it, it's a good uh, I think uh, statement. Um, um, now I would say, well, government uh, government agency that include not only the federal government but local uh, local government. I think uh, that in perhaps include that term government agencies. Um, and, and again, I think it's very general. Uh, perhaps may we may or it should be made more specific in certain aspects. But I think in overall, I I have uh, no um, no observation that is very relevant. I think. All right. So it's it's positive, Christopher. Yeah, I, I think I'm pretty much in the same position. Uh, I, I think it's um, society has to really, in some ways, seek out people who are disadvantaged, and then it, whether it be physical disability or you know emotional that type of thing or any any disability, um, we have to. I think part of providing for the common good is is to actively seek ways of helping people to achieve their potential and to achieve you know. What, what the basic requirements of what it means to be human. And, of course, one of those things is work and being able to support oneself. So basically, on the whole, I, I'm, I think it's a good statement. All right. Well, let me stir it around a little bit. I wonder if we'd agree that the language might say something along the lines of disability rights and the full development of disabled persons. Otherwise, we're limiting ourselves to rights. Right. 
Yes. Right. That's, that's yes. a good observation. Yes. Okay. Right, because otherwise, what seems that the significant concern will be disability right and not the person. Yes. And yes. then in the second sentence, government agencies working with the disabled mm-hmm. must ensure that financial benefits are applied fairly and consistently. When you come to be personally involved with disabled people, one of the things that soon becomes obvious is they they live in a world of forms. We want a benefit, you deserve a benefit, but we'll be fair in applying uh, the benefit, but you have to fill out these forms. And there are any number of disabilities such that the people who suffer from the disabilities, you have to wonder how they navigate the forms. Mm-hmm. We have all over America uh, places mm-hmm. to help you with your income taxes. And right, it's right. A good thing because a lot of people need a lot of help with their income taxes, and and I'm just happy that my wife doesn't need my help. <laughs> anyway, well, well, <laughs> I don't want to go there. <laughs> at any rate, good. At any rate. <laughs> When you have uh, someone with a disability in your own family and and you see how these forms multiply and then you think to yourself, many people who are disabled don't really have family members who can help them with the world of forms, then what happens is, and there's a, a kind of a vicious circle here, what happens is, those people will have a form that tells them that they can get help filling out their forms from uh, this, that, or the other social work agency. Uh, But, of course, they have to fill out a form for that. And, And that's another example of how we have to go from the forms of the formal to the um, walking with uh, the disabled on the part of all sorts of people in every walk of of life. And that's something that really calls for going beyond the government, and it it calls into a a kind of sense of civic participation. Now, in terms of uh, Catholic efforts here, there are any number of Catholic elementary schools that have people who would like uh, disabled children, their disabled children, to be able to be uh, in the school, in the parish school. And, And sometimes they can, but lots of times they can't. And lots of times parish bulletins will have some writer saying, our school is open to everyone, et cetera, and all the usual, et cetera. However, we cannot always uh, uh, commit ourselves to helping people who have special needs because we simply don't have the ability to do so. Well, there are limits, of course, but one of the reasons why uh, Catholic parish schools don't have the ability to do so is because they don't get adequate support from the members of the parish. Yeah. And that's a real problem. And sometimes the schools in the parish, uh, case in point for our particular parish, um, they they get support from the parish, but the next parish, uh, next uh, parish over, there, there's no support. The parish school runs on its own on the premises of the parish and with a number of students from the parish, but they have to make or break themselves because they don't get any support from the parish. So in terms of what's broadly referred to as special education, I think that Catholic parishes have often had a a basically good will, but, but seldom have they been able to to give the kind of special education that uh, families within the parish would very much wish for for their children. Mm-hmm. So that's something we Catholics could do a lot better with, and I'm sure the, the Lutheran schools, and there are a decent number of Lutheran schools here in, 
uh, Los Angeles. I'm sure that Lutheran schools have the very same problem. Well, we go ahead to the yeah. yes or or not comment. Well, it, just uh, one comment about that. Um, when we talk about uh, effort to incorporate the disabled, disabled person into work of volunteer programs, so we need to have volunteer programs first. We need people involved. It's, uh, we need people with. Uh, engage in 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 in, part, in participate have civic participation. That also I- imply that we are proposing and we should be proposing a model of society which is not mere merely um, competitive, or merely a society which is getting r- delivered the good from the state down to to the individual down to the family so that. We are building our society from the bottom up, if you will. And that is being shown very clearly when you come to the U.S. to live from a different uh, way of organizing society. The history of Latin America precisely has been the opposite, where the church, because a different concordat, a different relationship with the, with the state, and very often has been officially Catholic. By doing that, by, by um, having this uh, legal system, constitutional system, the church received through uh, the general budget, through the tax, through taxes, uh, the fund that they need in order to keep their parish going. That gives society, particularly Catholic, a sense of... Um, not being very engaged, disengagement, because um, ultimately the state is the one who is taking care of the church. And the faithful is there just to worship, but not particularly interested in forming any voluntary association in order to keep things going. And so when the time came, particularly in the last part of the 20th century, that there were so many constitutional reform, and then the secularism, secularization began um, taking um, hold there. Uh, many states are separate from the church. And so what happened was the church did not receive any more, at least in, in most countries, uh, money from the state. Uh, the faithful is not ready to jump in and help because they were not educated in this, in this sense of voluntarism, if you will, association, civic engagement. And so in, in many institutions, the church just collapsed. And, and I think that means that ultimately is that the system there was not a system which was built on the common good. The common good, I think, was misunderstood. The common good was whatever the state can provide and we will receive this sense of paternalism, we can discuss that historically where this idea come from. But I think that is a good, I think, a good point. In other words, we can deal with or we can be very, um, um, very uh, concerned and help the disabled person insofar as we have created a society, which is what we may, we may call a caring society, which is based upon on the principles, if you will, of solidarity and principle of subsidiarity as well. And, and I have seen that because you see in the U.S. whether in some ways people forget here some things, but the difference is huge. And when you read Tocqueville, uh, as I've read uh, more than once, Alexis de Tocqueville, when he talked about the sense of community in American 1830s, um, you, when you come from outside, you, I think, understand better what Tocqueville was talking about. He's talking about in that uh, book of uh, commentaries or memoirs. That's just my comment about this. <clears throat> yes, uh, we have to keep the common good constantly in mind with a sense also of a particular situation. So the situation in Latin America had been very different from that in the United States. Let's go ahead to the next bullet point. 
unjust employment discrimination and poor working conditions hinder career advancement and financial stability. We must insist on legal protection for occupational safety and compensation, good faith in hiring and retention, and paid leave for illness and child rearing. One more time on that. Unjust employment discrimination and poor working conditions hinder career advancement and financial stability. We must insist on legal protection for occupational safety and compensation, good faith in hiring and retention, and paid leave for illness and child rearing. What about that, Mario? Well, the... Is um, the statement is uh, is quite short. Basically, what I see there is, um, I think it's clear. Uh, nevertheless, should be perhaps um, included some terms there. It's unjust discrimination and poor working conditions. Um, hinder career advancement and financial stability. Um, again, working conditions for um, for workers, for employees, perhaps need to be qualified a little better. That um, that statement. Um, now the working condition is not only something that may hinder career advancement and financial stability. Also, the satisfaction that one may have in his own and work. Um, so, then legal protection, of course, for occupational and compensation, etc. Um, I think it's, um, it's a fair statement. Um, in general. That's my first reaction. All right. And Christopher? Well, I got a sense of bathos reading that line. The first line we were talking about something that seems the, the gravity of the, of the terms unenjoyed, unjust employment discrimination and poor working conditions. And then we end up why are these bad? Because they hinder career advancement and financial stability. I would what I think that there's more serious uh, things they hinder than that. So those, not that those are not important, but right. that they're that they're in themselves violations of human dignity. Uh, mm-hmm. You don't mm-hmm. treat human right. beings a certain way, and that seems to be the more serious thing. And so it almost, I almost got this feeling that it was we were descending into um, NPR concerns. You know, the kind of things you would hear people complain about at NPR, talking about NPR, not what I would expect. Uh, a group like the American Solidarity Party to be emphasizing. Um, that being said, I mean, um, I don't have any profound, any other real objections to the, to the statement. I would just wish it were a bit stronger, more universal maybe. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's terrific to have career advancement. It's wonderful to have financial stability. But you could imagine having career uh, advancement and financial right, stability right. in a corporation that right, produces right. something that is largely worthless and right, right. sold at a profit because of uh, astute marketing strategies. And there you could be doing something that really doesn't advance you as a person. It doesn't build you up as a person. And the products that you produce don't really build up other people as persons. I mean, you could imagine, I don't know whether I'm going to hit the the nail very close to the head here, but suppose you're working someplace that produces dietary supplements, and the dietary Uh supplements... Uh, are at best useful only if people, uh, for the most part, insist on eating junk food. (laughs) And if they'd stop eating junk food and eat real food, they wouldn't need the dietary supplements. But here you are, and there are plenty of 
buy-in companies that produce dietary supplements that if we had a little bit of common sense, we wouldn't need in the first place. And you could get rich, and your career could advance, and you could have a lot of stability. But what you're working to bring about is really not worth bringing about. So uh, when we think about the, the role of work, it's, it's not only the, the transitive dimension, what, what you produce, but whether the work intransitively or imminently makes you to be a better person. And that's lost here, isn't it? Yeah, I think it is. I, um, it, it, it's almost funny to me how, where it ends up, how the first um, sentence concludes. Like I said it's like a, it's like a, it's like a bathhouse. Thud. <laughs> Thud. Yeah. <laughs> Thud. Yeah. Not with a so, bang, but a whimper. <laughs> right. So I think the question that we need to raise as a member of the American Solidarity Party, or those who share our Catholic experience, Catholic faith, is that. What is the the fulfillment that we get for our work? Uh, perhaps we may not get the whole fulfillment in a particular job, but there is some satisfaction, some service that we are providing, and so and that service cannot be measured by career advancement. So otherwise, uh, we are looking for just prestige or money, and and I think that is key. Now that changed the whole the whole dynamic of the culture, uh, which precisely, um, let's say, a graduate in engineering want to go and um, try to do some um, work with a company or big corporation and do fracking, and so it cause a lot of uh, um, uh, instability in the soil and maybe earthquake whatever the case may be, and make a lot of money. And so is that the only goal that one has in um, in their work? And so if that work doesn't hinder the advancement, is that enough? My answer would be no. I think we need to look at for a different uh, perspective, a different uh, worldview, if you will. Right. Well, yeah. it's, 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 it's difficult because... So deeply ingrained in the American psyche, I think. Uh, my, my father's generation. My father was a World War II veteran, but his generation was when you ever uh, people's age, you criticized a rich man for doing something that you thought wasn't quite right. They would say something like, "Well, he's laughing all the way to the bank." That was sort of like the justification for everything he did, for the fact that he was happy with the amount of money he was making. And um, I think that's still deep. It's deep within the American psyche that um, you 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 even you, you you choose where you live. You choose your your profession based upon prime, first and foremost upon how much money you make. There's another section here that we could look at a little bit more closely. The phrase uh, things that we insist on. Good faith in hiring and retention. There's also a matter of good faith in in hiring and working your job. Uh, I I've heard again and again from people of basically goodwill of problems of European countries where where workers who shouldn't be retained are retained. <laughs> In fact, uh, it becomes so obvious that companies are hesitant to, to hire because they'll never be able to fire. And, and as a result, there are all sorts of strategies, some not so legitimate. Let's not hire anybody full-time because if we hire anybody full-time, we'll never be able to fire them no matter if they do nothing full-time. And we, we do have one example that that's, gets a certain amount of attention here in the United States, the problem of bad teachers. Um, on the one hand, teachers should be given decent salaries. You ought to be able to raise a family on the salary you get from teaching. 
On the other hand, and this is partly because of of union corruption, there are plenty of bad teachers who can't Mm -hmm. be fired, and so the whole system is is, um, sabotaged from within. So it's a both sides thing. Uh, If we're talking about work and good work, we want to talk about good hiring practices, but we want to talk about the good working practices of, of the people who are working. We could do one more, as all of us were running, running behind here, but we could do one more before we wrap up for this particular podcast. And it, it's a shift here of focus, very definitely. We oppose conscription into the armed services and other forms of compulsory government service, except in cases of clear and present necessity during declared war, as described in our foreign policy section. We also oppose mandatory registration of women in the selective service system. One more time around on this. We oppose conscription into the armed services and other forms of compulsory government service, except in cases of clear and present necessity during declared war, as described in our foreign policy section. We also oppose mandatory registration of women in the selective service system. How does that look to you, Mario? Hmm. Well, um, it seems clear um there is no place for the draft here um but um so that is consistent in our platform with the foreign policy um proposal i think um so uh, that means uh, we have an exception precisely and that uh, uh, referred to what we said, uh, we say in the foreign policy section. Another discussion is foreign policy discussion. But yeah. perhaps we need a little bit about that in order to understand the first part of the, of the statement. All and right. so... So, mm, given the time but, crunch, given the time crunch, I'm going to quick shift to Christopher and see if he has any thoughts on this statement as it is here. Well, yeah, it's, I think it's I think it's too vague. Um, what are what does it mean to be cases of clear and present necessity during declared war? Um, if the if our current adventures in the Middle East had been declared wars, would we thereby support conscription if the government deemed it necessary? Um, I think I think it needs to be spelled out more under what circumstances um, what circumstances constitute clear and present necessity. Is it an invasion of the country that would justify a conscription, or is it simply the fact the United States decides to go to war in a country to secure its oil and therefore needs enough troops in order to do so? What is that? Right. right. What is that clear and present necessity? I, I think I think this could have had a lot more teeth in it. Um, right. I confess I'm I'm general I'm basically in, opposed to conscription. I would also say I would I, I would hope they would say we also oppose mandatory registration of men and women in the selective services. I, I would call I want to see an abolition of that. But I I'm, I guess I'm more on the more radical end of things on in this question. There is this irony that there's reason to want more formal declarations of war in order to prevent uh, a given administration simply from acting in an a, a, a unrestricted uh, way involving itself in a country and in foreign adventures. So the idea is uh, at least we could say that, yes, this counts as a war. But on the other hand, if you say, yes, this counts as a war, then all the measures uh, involving the draft come into play. Uh, So there's a a worry there. And, of course, you wonder, 
Why is it that women should not be required to register in the selective service system, but but men should? Uh, why require anyone to be registered? And then that takes us back to, well, we have to in cases of clear and present necessity, but then we're not going to say what those cases are. So we, we have a few stakes set up in this point or a few stakes put up, but we don't know how the stakes are related to each other or what connects them. Right, right. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, I mean, it's sort of funny, yeah. uh, some, of our, some of our declared wars, like the Mexican-American War, the Spanish-American War, uh, are examples of wars that didn't need to be fought, but yet they were declared, and they had a need of, I don't think they, they didn't draft anybody in these wars, but... Still, I mean, conceivably, they could be drafted. So. All right. Now, there is one more bullet point that we have here. And while we're really close to the end of our time, we have the most generous sponsor in uh, En Route Books and Media uh, with WCAT, it's, its radio presence. And so I'm going to read this, and rather than dig, dig, dig into it, it's kind of long. Let's have some some highlights, uh, questions that we might want to raise, and then we'll end for the podcast. The government should not use national security. Hmm, we were thinking about that. The government should not use national security to justify expanded censorship and secrecy in addition to concerns about online censorship uh, to be discussed in the civics section. Again, here a connection. Our commitment to civil liberties includes repeal of the Patriot Act and the reinstatement of basic civil rights, including the rights of citizens to a speedy trial in civilian courts. Secret tribunals such as the FISA court, F-I-S-A, that's the U.S. Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, if you're not familiar with the acronym. The U.S. Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court must be abolished and military courts must be returned to their proper role. Foreign non-combatants must not be detained in American facilities or remanded by agents of the federal government to foreign prisons. What about that? Mario? Well, I think the statement is, in, is consistent with, uh, I mean, in general terms, it's consistent with the the ethic of life, the, the whole life. And so, um, and also uh, defending uh, in the, uh, the, uh, individual freedoms. And so that's the first reaction that I have. Uh, there are many other issues there that um, we can go and expand a little bit, but that's the first impression that I get. Okay. Well, Christopher? Yeah, basically the same. I, I would say the same thing. Um, I... It, it, it's, it, it, it cites particular instances of measures the government takes, which one might argue maybe in certain cases of clear and present danger and necessity might be justified. Um, but in the in the condition we are now, I don't think they are justified. So I would, you know, I, I I'd like to say that I think that. Uh, if we're going to have secret tribunals, we ought to have them only in cases of grave necessity, and people ought to know that they exist, at the very right. least. Right. I, I would imagine that nine out of ten American citizens have a clue as to what a FISA court is. And these are uh, this is a court, really, that determines who can be... Uh, Tailed, <laughs> to use the talk of TV shows, or taped or recorded by the government. So we ought to at least know the existence of the court that is planting the bug uh, on the grounds that this court thinks a bug need to be planted. Uh, well, let, let's end for uh, today, 
And let's tell our gentle listeners that while we have no intention of forgetting the platform of the American Solidarity Party and uh, well, the next plank, criminal justice is certainly going to merit our close attention. Turn this next week because, well, we've talked about and we continue to talk about the common good. And Senator Marco Rubio of Florida has just very recently given an address at Notre Dame Law School. And the title, as I recall it, is Common Good Capitalism. So that's what we'll be looking at next week, and then we'll return to the platform. Let's end, as we always do, in prayer. And the gospel for today is the gospel from Luke. Asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus said in reply, The coming of the kingdom of God cannot be observed, and no one will announce, look, here it is, or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is among you. Then he said to his disciples, The days will come when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you will not see it. There will be those who will say to you, look, there he is, or look, here he is. Do not go off, do not run in pursuit, for just as lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first he must suffer greatly and be rejected by this generation. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Hi, everyone. Dr. John Aquaviva here, author, professor of exercise science, and host of Faith in Sport on WCAT Radio. Please join us as we discuss current events in the sports world, bring on inspiring guests, and discuss how our Catholic faith impacts all who are involved in sport, the athletes, the coaches, the referees, and yes, even the fans. So join me, Dr. John Aquaviva, as I discuss my two favorite topics, my faith and the world of sport, on the Faith in Sports Show here on WCAT Radio. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.